Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He is in our shadow. You heard in the gospel that I just read, and then you also hear in other gospels that Jesus promises us persecution, and that in the end of the day's gospel, that even some of our own family may turn against us. So that's the crazy faith that you joined, you know? <laughs> Did he say, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't hear anything about prosperity in that, you know, about how you would prosper and have many houses and lots of kids and stuff. I, but he did promise that we would be persecuted. And we're not so far away from that persecution historically because we can look back on a time and we actually have people in our parish who experienced that persecution as they lived in, in, in uh, the USSR. And today commemorates the new martyrs and confessors of Russia. Just to give you an idea of the persecution that, that took place within the Russian lands, within uh, the USSR, when after the revolution, there are things we can't even imagine. I mean, I mean, we're aware in, in America that, you know, a guy's cake shop got shut down, you know, and uh, a few people get sued. You know, the Satanists want to put a statue out in front of a courthouse. Um, you know, there's some fights in colleges about what can be said and what can't be said. And that's not something to be trifled after. That's problematic. But in the Russian lands during the revolution, churches were razed to the ground or just destroyed. Some were turned into bars. Some were turned into museums or, um, or movie theaters. Occasionally, during different levels of the persecution, the clergy would get a knock on their door. And if they didn't answer their door, the Gestapo would come in and take them. Oftentimes, most commonly, they would be shot in the head that night. Mass, there were mass graves. Occasionally, they were sent to gulags, where they might live for 10, maybe 25 years. But most people didn't make it out of the gulags. And if you were at the gulags, you knew that you might die because you were beaten to death. You might die because of starvation. Certainly, sickness was a threat. Or, because your usefulness waned, you might be, again, killed and pushed into a mass grave. You saw um, times when people, and I've heard stories from um, people affiliated with our community, where the faithful at home had people spying on them. Where as you would pray, and you'd possibly pray in your own home, you'd be concerned about people seeing you because they might report you. And the reporting of you would affect your standing in the community. Or again, it might put you in prison or a gulag. There are many laity who are simply doing Christian acts, showing mercy, trying to feed the poor, trying to help people in the name of Christ, who were imprisoned and killed. There was entire mockery of the faith. Uh, the story, I believe, I think, I don't know where I heard this, I'm thinking it's Richard Wormbrand, of, of the priest who was in prison who was asked to commune his faithful with feces to humiliate them. All of these actions of atheism, of Satanism, all of these actions were done for two reasons. One is that the church was seen as a threat to the state, a subversive ideal, something attached to the old world, the old traditions, that needed to be thrown out, that needed to be revised. 
But secondarily, as the people watch it, their churches destroyed, as they watch their clergy and their bishops get killed and, and be humiliated, as they watch the simple faithful get reported and persecuted, it, it was meant to teach them something. It was meant to show the regular people, the atheists, there is no God. You want to follow their God? Look at how he protects them. Look at how God deals with his people as that priest was dragged out and beaten to death. So many stories like this. And if you were to go through and read the story, each, uh, I think there's over 1,700 people who have been recognized as new martyrs that, uh, officially. But that is a tiny drop compared to the suffering that happened at the hands of the leaders of the USSR and under that communism. And that's just in the USSR. We also have, I heard a story uh, in Albania about uh, under communism, uh, Albania being one of the strictest uh, forms of communism, uh, a little bit more militantly atheistic and more likely to die you were if you were a Christian. But there's a story of a simple uh, elderly family and they would go and they would bow at their corner every day and the children didn't really know why. I believe Father uh, Luke Veronis told this story. He was over in Albania. And eventually um, they would bow and they would, you know, it's just very quiet. But later as they remodeled the house or I'm not sure uh, some of the details they ended up finding out that that was their icon corners that the icons had been buried in the walls that they were so afraid to even have an image of Christ or the Theotokos in their house in their private residence that they had to bury it in the walls and that in their faithfulness they still wanted to worship God but that they knew that it was surely going to be death if it was public. This is the image of persecution that we have in our modern age. And we don't know if that's coming for us as well at some point. As society changes, as society turns, I'm certain that the Russian people didn't think that this was going to happen the way it happened. But it did happen. And it was a fulfillment of Jesus' um, proclamation, his, uh, uh, what he just said, which was that we will be persecuted. We've been promised that. It's, going to, it's expected. It's something that's always coming for us, whether it be in this generation or the next generation. How are we to prepare for such a thing? Well, in the one hand, in one way, there's no way to prepare because when you're beaten to death, it takes you out of yourself. You know, this type of violence, we're not made for it. We're not made to experience this type of persecution. It destroys. It destroys us and it destroys the people committing it. Nonetheless, the only way to prepare is by our simple faithfulness. Our simple everyday faithfulness is how those people prepared to face their martyrdom. God has to give us the grace to face what might be coming. Without that grace, you know, like I said, we're all living in our heads, we're psychological, we'll die. Maybe we'll leave the faith. Maybe we'll apostatize. Maybe we'll even join the persecutors. We don't know. But if we're faithful, by faithfulness I mean regularly praying, regularly fasting, regularly partaking of the liturgical cycle which forms us in our faith, regularly making connection to Christ, making connection to our community, making pilgrimage to monasteries to deepen our faith, having spiritual relationships with the people within our community and beyond, 
being intimate with Christ, these are the things that ultimately made it so many of the people in Russia would not compromise. Now, their lack of compromise led them to death. But what we heard in today's gospel is that their death, that actually the words that they would use would be a testimony. They would be a testimony to all generations. This is how we think about it in the early church. You know, the early church had martyrs. Um, there was various persecutions. Some were softer. Some were uh, radically, you know, if you're a Christian, you're going to die. But it was on those very bones of the martyrs and, and the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. The church was raised up from the witness of the martyrs and we have many of their stories just like we have many stories of these Russian martyrs of their faithfulness, their dedication to Christ in the face of, again, not prosperity but persecution. That these stories not only inspire us, but they tell us the true purpose of our life. Our true purpose of our life isn't to be rewarded here. It isn't to simply be blessed here and have a good day here. That our true purpose of our life is to become Christ-like. And if we follow our master, we will be persecuted in some way. The reward for our persecution is the crown of martyrdom. It is the reward we receive in heaven for our faithfulness. You see, the atheists were correct in a way. For the average person, we're looking for, and the average American even, wants to see religious devotion as something that makes us prosperous and well-adjusted. Who nowadays wants to be a part of a persecuted religion? Who nowadays wants to be in the minority, to be unpopular, to be the, whatever the bad word is of the day, the boogeyman of the day? Nobody. And sometimes we're willing to compromise our faith in order to get along, in order to be with the spirit of the day and age in order not to draw too much attention to ourselves or draw too much attention. We don't want to people to be embarrassed of our Christianity. Again, in our faithfulness, we will grow in integrity. In our integrity, we will be persecuted. And rather than being proof, proof that there is no God, the martyrs in the way they withstood their sufferings actually prove the very existence of Christ. They prove the peace. They show that when their blood falls, that churches rise again. They show what it is to be truly faithful, even when it's unpopular. I don't know that we'll suffer persecution in the next 30 years or whatever, but may we take heed of the time we live in and begin to dedicate ourselves to being faithful in everyday orthodoxy, in everyday living of the faith, so that if the time does come, we're prepared to face it with the same tenacity, the same boldness, the same prayerfulness, the same charity and love that was manifested in the stories of the new martyrs of Russia. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. He is in our